ओके वेल हेलो एंड वेलकम वंस अगेन टू किताबी बातें आई एम अभिषेक आल्सो नोन एज बुक्स वाले भैया माय गेस्ट टुडे इज अ पर्सन हु नीड्स नो इंट्रोडक्शन एंड व्हेन आई से दैट ही नीड्स नो इंट्रोडक्शन आई एक्चुअली मीन दैट ऑल आई कैन से इज दैट आई एम एब्सोल्युटली ऑनर्ड एंड थ्रिल्ड टू हैव डॉक्टर कोनार्ड एल्स विद मी टुडे ऑन माय पॉडकास्ट हु इज वन ऑफ द ग्रेटेस्ट इंडोलॉजिस्ट एंड हिंदू थिंकर्स एंड थॉट लीडर्स ऑफ आवर टाइम्स डॉक्टर एल्स इट्स एन ऑनर टू हैव यू हियर थैंक यू वेरी मच फॉर एग्रीइंग माय एग्रीइंग टू कम टू माय पॉडकास्ट Yes, thank you for the invitation. And this is Dr. L's latest book, Forever Ayodhya, which is his compilation of his uh, writings on the Ayodhya movement. And while we'll talk about the Ayodhya movement and other things, but sir, before that, I would like to ask you how it all began for you. How did you develop that interest in understanding India and then Hindu culture, which led you to do a lot of research and write some really amazing books? How did all this happen? Well, the first time I came to India was just at the time of the Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi's ban on Salman Rushdie's book, The Satanic Verses. Satanic Verses. And so, in the, the opinion pages of the newspapers, especially in the communist fortnightly frontline, there was a lot of debate about whether this ban was justified. not a debate between hindus and muslims or between hindus and secularists but among different factions of the secularists and so the hard secularists principally the communists opposed the ban you see they said along with karl marx himself that criticism of religion is the basis is the root of all criticism And so it's very important to protect the right to criticize to criticize religion. Whereas some uh, Congressites, like Khushwant Singh at the time, and M J Akbar, today is a BJP ideologue, but back yes. then he was with yes. Congress. He was a, a close confidence man of Rajiv Gandhi. They defended the ban. They thought that it was secularly necessary. to protect the feelings of the muslim minority anyway so this was an interesting debate which already alerted me to the fact that secularism in india does not mean secularism or has a, a meaning that to us in the west at that time was unthinkable now um so that much uh, for the rushdi affair but i noticed that it was rooted in the ayodhya affair you see yeah. uh, rajiv gandhi had decided on this ban as a gesture towards sayed shahabuddin who was the leader of one of the two movements in favor of the babri masjid so sayed shahabuddin had um, announced a muslim march on ayodhya to coincide with the hindu gathering there and so as uh, gandhi thought, thought you know this is the formula for a blood bath he invited shahabuddin and he said look we want you to call off this march what do you want in return and so one of the things he wanted in return was the ban on this book that was promptly done you know for rajiv gandhi this was not a matter of principle he just wanted to be practical you know no bloodshed come on and uh, so that's that's how congress at the time did things and uh, anyway so that's what got me interested in the ayodhya affair so as as someone who has read extensively on hindu dharm on, on ayodhya and i would say practically all aspects of hinduism when we talk of ayodhya one narrative is that this is hindu renaissance in a way Uh, i remember at the time of uh, the somnath temple pandit nehru resisted it saying that it's hindu revivalism which he detested today we say okay it is hindu revivalism which is happening and on the other end there are people who rather than calling it hindu revivalism or faith or anything they completely deny the existence of ram or many even go on to say that there is nothing like hinduism it's britishers who who uh, did everything for india or the moguls and before that there was no india no hindu civilization even though there is plenty of evidence which suggests uh, that there was a very uh, great hindu civilization which still exists 
how do you see these two completely contrasting views yeah <laughs> part of it of course has to do with non indian factors namely certain trends in our views of uh, history so there used to be a trend mostly late 19th century again a little bit after the second world war of being ultra skeptical and denouncing everything religious everything pre-modern as unrealistic as fantasy as invention and so in that context you see everything of religion was doubted did jesus exist did muhammad exist did rama exist and so uh, while that wave has um, subsided in the west like today you see people think you know all scholars concerned think that jesus did exist he was not a son of god he was not born from a virgin he was not resurrected from the dead he did not save humanity from sin but nevertheless he existed there is a really existing character on which all these rather tall claims have been built and so similarly rama did exist and you see here we have a number of historical sources in his in indian literature that all together confirm that rama existed to what extent his adventures were real you know that's a, a second question but yeah. there is no doubt that he existed true and it is a bit obsolete um of the of some secularists to keep on claiming no no it's all mythological it's all just a story right. you see that's a, an outdated uh, approach right and when we say we doubt the historicity of rama i mean whenever we say history whether it's ramayana mahabharat and, and as you mentioned in the book it's history with embellishments and as uh, vivek devrai ji who translated ramayana mahabharat in many for hindu text he said that by the original story of rama can never be reproduced but this is how history is there was a the oral tradition of storytelling and of course when it's passed from generations to generations of course it won't be exactly the same but to completely deny it is something uh, which i would say wrong mm -hmm. so i have i may be a proud hindu but if a muslim comes and says about muhammad or a christian talks about jesus why should i deny that this absolutely no point so why you yes. think in india you said this view changed but in india and as i when i read your book i realized that i think while we talk about politicization of the ram janmabhoomi movement which could have been you know resolved long back i believe the way i look at it that leftist historians and intellectuals actually through their you know uh, messaging actually you know uh, help just to you know this cause grow further and further it could have been resolved earlier but due to their mm -hmm. you know you know oh no hindu existed or nothing like that i think the left leaning intellectuals also did a lot of damage to the overall movement and its resolution so would you agree to that yes um i think the role of the statement of the so called eminent historians yes. uh initially the j and u historians then later people from aligarh people from delhi university and so on quite a number of historians uh yes. put public opinion under pressure to admit you see no there was never a temple and right. this has made a big difference also in politics it's it's rare that intellectuals get that kind of influence but so the movement would have been um simpler and much less bloody if that yes. pressure hadn't existed you see in in the the 1980s rajiv gandhi actually worked towards a solution which included giving a temple to the hindus yes and so some some moves by him that have been criticized like especially the overruling of the shabano verdict in which yes. he restored the sharia the islamic law as the norm for divorce arrangements among muslims uh you see that has been criticized as obscurantist and so on all right i don't disagree nevertheless you should understand this as part of his strategy to give some sweeteners to the muslim leadership 
and then in return give the temple site to the Hindus. And so at that time, you see, he thought he could get away with this usual Congress side horse trading. It had not yet become a big, you know, very polarizing issue. After the historians intervened and said, no, no, this is all a Hindu concoction. This is a very evil fascist and so on uh, concoction. Uh, then you see many of the middle of the road politicians, especially in Congress, developed cold feet. You said that they didn't want to associate themselves with the temple anymore. And so then this became a very conflictual issue. Yes. So while, yeah, finally, you know, we, we do have that uh, the temple there. And yes, you're right. It could have been done without, uh, with much less of, uh, you know, violence and, you know, all the political upheavals and everything. So we yeah. label it as a step toward Hindu uh, revivalism. Uh, and one thing, so uh, how do you also see the role of the foreign media? Because I remember you talked about the, fr even mm -hmm. in France, wherein many people in France, you know, worship and consider as, uh, the goddess and they they pray and everything nothing of this sort yeah. finds any much mention in the international media why is it that the issue related to india and which is specific to indians gets so much of coverage in the international media mm -hmm. is every country yes you know just yes you see at that time i think the role of the foreign media was much larger than it is today yes you see right now with the prana pratishtha when you see the reporting in the BBC, in the Wall Street Journal, in, you know, our own uh, national uh, TV broadcaster in Belgium and so on, uh, you still see quite a bit of hostility. This time they can't go as far as to deny the existence of the temple. Exactly. They can't go flat, you know, against the evidence which, which motivated the judge's uh, verdict. But you see, they try the next best thing from their viewpoint, which is to simply re remain silent about it. Many newspapers have not even mentioned anything happening in Ayodhya, even though it was a big national event in the biggest democracy in the world. And uh, so many of them didn't mention that, or those who mentioned the event didn't explain the event. Why is this event so important? And so they said, yeah, it was on the site of a Muslim mosque. Well, you see, I am very happy that they deplore and reject the demolition of uh, places of worship. But then that's precisely why they should object to this Babri Masjid. That was precisely an embodiment of the violent replacement of places of worship. Ah, but the readers were not allowed to, to know that because they simply didn't mention that before the mosque, uh, at least two successive temples on that site have been demolished. And so you see there you have a, a very strong uh, movement of disinformation in a clever new way, which is to yes. partly speak out, to actually inform about the ceremony in Ayodhya, but then leave out a very important, a decisive part of the explanation why this had become so important. Right. So you, you still see that enmity. However, it has practically no influence in India. You see a few, a few editors in India still live in the past and try to yes. play off the Wall Street Journal or the BBC as big authorities, you know, to whom Indians ought to listen. You see, today that doesn't work anymore. But 30, 35 years ago, that was a very strong influence. So what you had there was what I call the circular argument of authority. So the press correspondents from the Western media in Delhi, you see, they hang out in the cocktail circuit with Indian secularists, yes. and they are their main source of information. So whatever is uh, spoon-fed to them by the Indian secularists is what they tell the Western audience. Then people in the West take this as received wisdom and make statements on the basis of that. 
then those statements are quoted again back in India, where they say, oh, yeah, this big man from Harvard has, you know, spoken yes. out. And yes, he also says there was no temple there. But, you know, he has no other information than precisely the Indian secularists. So back then it was quite important. Uh, today it is much less so. And so the the influence of foreigners was all, all negative. They were all safely in the pocket of the uh, eminent historians in India. Yes, so there are still traces, for example, we have Audrey Trushke who says that uh, Aurangzeb was not that bad as he was made out to be. And then people saying, okay, a lot of Hindu kings also, you know, they raised temples, they stole the, uh, the this sanctum sectorum, they stole the uh, idols mm -hmm. and everything. So why do blame a particular community? That is the narrative, which is unfortunately still to an extent uh, prevailing, though not that dominant, yes. but it is still there. That Hindus also did, why blame the Muslims only? Or Aurangzeb was, as I said, not that bad. He, he rebuilt mm -hmm. the temples. Yes, about Aurangzeb, we're going to hear a lot more uh, the coming months uh, because of the events in Kashi, in, in Varanasi. Yes. Um, so this archaeologist report, report confirming that obviously there was a temple there has now strangely uh, been affirmed, been uh, accepted by both uh, Ifan Habib, who was one of the eminent historians back then, okay. and by Audrey Trushke, who is a very fervent uh, champion of Aurangzeb. And so here you see they accept, you know, obviously here there's no point in denying the Hindu temple destruction because everyone can see it. Even before the archaeologist report, you could see that the walls of the original Hindu temple had been masoned into the mosque and very purposely, namely to show off the victory of Islam over idolatry. So, yes. you see here, there won't be a, a serious a scholars debate anymore, because here there's just no point in opposing the obvious fact that uh, a temple was uh, destroyed by Aurangzeb. However, um, the other uh, point you mentioned, namely that Hindu kings did the same thing and so on, that is now some kind of a a second line of defense of the eminent historians and all the people in their camp. Um, so the narrative goes like this. Uh, in, in many uh, pagan cultures, uh, most strikingly in Mesopotamia, but in principle in all of them, uh, and so also in India to a limited extent, uh, you have the phenomenon that when kings uh, make war on each other, one of them wins, then he will uh, often, not always, but you know, what he may do is to emphasize his victory by abducting the main idol from the main temple of the loser, and then installing it in the main temple in his own capital. Okay, so these there are a few examples of this, you know, not like the 40,000 or something uh, exactly. number of uh, mosques forcibly replacing temples, but there have been a few cases. Okay. But, you know, it's a totally different scenario. Why? You see, what happens after this, this idol abduction? Then the worship in both places just continues. Let's say that a Shaiva king, as a Shaiva rival, he steals the uh, Murti or Shiva takes it back to his own Shiva temple, and in yes. you know in there in his own temple, the priest does the prana pratista and all the rituals, and the worship of Shiva continues, but at a different place. In the yes. loser's temple, of course, now there's an empty spot. You know, he has a sculptor or whoever make a new statue. It gets consecrated by the priest and the worship of Shiva continues. So Continue. the only thing that has happened is that a material object has changed places. That is absolutely yes. all, because the religion is not affected at all. Whereas, right. in the case of Islamic temple destructions, 
they meant to destroy Hinduism, to use the destruction of idols and temples as uh, a sign of, you see, we are busy destroying Hinduism. And a warning to the Hindus is your end is near. And yes. so that's a totally different thing from what Hindus did. There is also a second difference. You see, <laughs> the claim is made that Muslims destroy temples uh, in imitation of what Hindus did. Now, first of all, as I explained, it's not the same thing what Hindus did. But secondly, it is absurd to claim that Muslim kings started imitating Hindu kings and using this as justification for their behavior. You see, there is no case at all of a Hindu uh, a Muslim temple destroyer citing Hindu so-called temple destructions, in fact, idol abductions, uh, as the justification for what he himself did. What they all do, if at all they feel the need to justify, is to refer to earlier Muslim temple destroyers like uh, Mahmoud Ghaznavi, so as you talked about the 40,000 temples in Kashi, uh, as we talked about, so my next question was actually related to that. So we have moved from the time when the prime minister of the country talked about Somnath as some sort of Hindu revivalism to a time when the prime minister is doing the Pran Pratishta and this revivalism is being celebrated across the country. <laughs> How do you see the future from now on? Because even the RSS chief uh, Mohan Bhagwati said that, you know, let's now stop looking for a shivling in every mosque. There is no point in that. And there are some mm -hmm. who say that we should also try to get Kachi and Mathura and that's it. And there are some who say we should get back to, you know, all those 40,000 mosques and try to get a temple there. How do you see the future? What should be the uh, approach of Hindus? Well, um... Recently, Hindus have been singing the praise of the virtue of patience. You know, they've been saying, oh, you see, Rama was in exile, not for 14 years, like in the Ramayana, but for centuries. And yet, finally, he has come back, the return of the king. You know, when this, uh, this alleged uh, Shiva Lingam was discovered in Kashi one or two years ago, um, you know, then they, you know, everywhere on social media and so on, you saw this image of the bull Nandi, you know, who is normally, you know, depicted opposite the Shiva Lingam. And so they said, here you see, he's been waiting for centuries. Finally, the Shiva Lingam has come back. Okay, so if time is not that pressing, and I think in, in smaller temples, you know, you could really say that they are not that important. I don't say they're not important, but you know, seeing everything in its proper proportion, I don't think they are the priority. So I do think they can, most of them can wait a little while. What Hindus should do is concentrating on something which I consider more essential, winning back souls, to use a Christian, you know, parlance for a moment. Um, you see very many fellow Hindus, long ago have under pressure converted we see sometimes with a knife on their throat but mostly under social pressure like for example if you were a businessman you know having a quarrel with your neighbor who is also a businessman you take it to court and there you find that if there is a dispute between a muslim and a hindu it's invariably the muslim who wins and so you say, well, in that case, I better hurry to convert before my neighbor does so. And so quite a few people have converted like this. And so initially the conversion was not very serious, you know, but after one or two generations, these people have grown up in Islam. They know nothing but Islam. And then they, they become committed. And so every you know, fanatic act by Muslims in the subcontinent. Well, every, I can't say every, but I mean, most of them certainly are the handiwork of descendants of Hindus converted under pressure. And so, you know, you should remain aware of this background, even if they do things you really think are, are not all right, shouldn't have been done. Even then you should remain aware 
You see, I could have been in his place. If my great grandfather had, you know, thought it opportune to convert, I would have been doing this. And so, you know, all the ugly things that happened during the partition, violence and so on, for instance, you know, could have been done by many Mus uh, Hindus. You know, if circumstances were different, it is they who would have converted. And so, you know, you, you should also always, uh, you know, keep that broader context in mind, not judge too harshly. And so in this case, Keep in mind that, you know, Islam is not very deep, you know. Islam is like skin deep. You know, nobody is born as a Muslim. Um, and so they are, you know, groomed in that culture. They get gradually, let's use the term, indoctrinated in that ideology. But so there's nothing that you can't wash off there. And, you know, here I'm taking a very radical, very bloodless, but nevertheless also very radical view. Namely, I think that in the modern age, you know, it is not really defensible to keep people in this mental prison house of an irrational ideology. So I have lived through it myself. I'm here not advising anybody to do anything that I haven't gone through myself. You see, I come from a Catholic family in an, at that time, Catholic country. Everybody in my classroom and so on went to church on Sunday, everything. I was a choir boy in a church choir. And um, nevertheless, in adolescence, me and many of my classmates and so on started rebelling against this Catholicism. Then usually it's the eldest son who started, you know, like me. Then a younger brother followed. Then ultimately, often the parents followed. And then when more and more people started leaving the church, a very important, you know, shift was that the whole, the, the big mass of conformists who didn't have a deep conviction, who went to church because everybody went to church, then stopped going to church because everybody was stopping to go to church. Stop. And so, you see, in my lifetime, I have seen the evolution from a big majority of Catholics to a small minority of Catholics, which is the situation today. And so, you know, so, so I mean, and nobody has gotten much worse for this, you know, this has been a normal and in, in, in the most important way is a healthy evolution. I see the start of the same evolution, first of all, in the Muslim communities in, in my own country. You know, I see more and more people outgrowing Islam, like I myself have outgrown Catholicism. Then you see the same thing in the Muslim countries themselves, mostly where uh, Islam is not in confrontation with another religion. You see, the Palestinians are very fervent uh, Muslims. They also have very large families, precisely because strategically they want to make Islam as strong as possible. And so they're very conscious because they're in permanent confrontation with the Jewish population. Uh, by contrast, in Saudi Arabia, the Gulf states, uh, Tunisia and so on, this situation of confrontation doesn't exist. So they can freely follow the evolution of their consciousness. And so there you get more and more people leaving Islam. To the extent that the country is militantly Islamic, like Saudi Arabia, they usually uh, keep this discreet, but it's happening nevertheless. In other countries like Tunisia, like Lebanon, this is quite in the open. Uh, in in India, I don't expect too much of it, because here also, like in Palestine, Israel, you have this situation of permanent confrontation with non-Muslims. Yes. However, even in India, it is starting to happen. In Kerala, you have a society for ex-Muslims. And yes. so, you know, I think that the, the religious landscape is changing, and to this effect that 
Hinduism is also under the impact of the scientific temper of modern knowledge going to have to shed a bit of dead wood. There are some funny superstitions in his Hinduism. They will have to go. But yes, of you see, in Hinduism, these are peripheral things. You know, these are practices that are really not the essence of Hinduism. By contrast, in Christianity and Islam, I'm afraid that it is their basic doctrine that can't stand the light of modern science, of scholarship into their sources, you know, the life of the prophet or the life of Jesus and so on. I mean, um, so there, I, like, even in America, which used to be the last stronghold of Christianity, you know, which had loosed, lost much in Europe, in America it was still going strong. Even in America now, Christianity is losing its feathers. And so there are a number of scholars who, precisely under the influence of their deep knowledge of the Bible, see that, you know, this is ultimately untenable. You know, this can't be maintained in the modern age. So, yeah. you see, in the Islamic world, gradually this is starting to happen also. And so, for young Muslims these days, who have their doubts about about these philosophical matters, it has become very easy to find out the true story or the different opinions. It's just a mouse click and they get all these YouTube, uh, you know, podcasts uh, with all the, you know, different explanations about the, the Muslim sources, you know, archaeology of the Islamic sites, Islamic history, you know, what have they done to other religions and so on. And moreover, much of it, more and more of it, is being told by ex-Muslims, by people like them, with similar names, speaking the same language and so on. So more and more it becomes easy for the Muslim population to get access and friendly access, understanding access to explanations of what could be wrong with Islam. So, so when we see, as you talked about, what should be the future, I think when we talk of Hinduism and its future, one thing which we cannot ignore is the caste system. Now, when we talk about caste system, we often say that, you know, okay, this is uh, what we had originally was the Varna system, the Varna Vibhajan, and caste is more of a colonial construct. Nevertheless, the sad truth is that caste discrimination and caste-based violence is still very much there. So when we say we try to defend or we explain what exactly is the caste system, how do you see that in the light of the fact that whatever it is, discrimination and violence is still a part of the Hindu society? Well, um, the word still is not entirely correct. You see, there are some of the old caste discriminations you know, in the, in the village, you know, in, in ordinary social life, you still have high caste discriminating against low caste, yes. against untouchables. This is not entirely gone, although much less than it used to be. What's However, this? there are new forms of caste discrimination, including, most remarkably, reverse discrimination. So, yes. you have the um, Scheduled Caste, Scheduled Tribe Atrocity Act which um, which does away with a very fundamental principle of law, namely equality before the law. You see, it, it, it effectively says that in a legal dispute between a high caste and a low caste, if the low caste can more or less make credible at first sight that this is a caste issue, um, then automatically he's in a favorable position and it's the other yeah. person who has to you know prove that he's innocent uh, this is a bad principle it also exists between husband and wife you know that if they quarrel then automatically the wife is supposed to be in the right the husband is supposed to be the offender uh, and indeed at the end of the uh, manmohan singh regime there was a a, a bill uh, for, you know, the communal violence bill, which also uh, meant that if there's a religious riot between Hindus and Muslims, automatically Hindus are 
taken to be the guilty party. Yes. Um, so you see, uh, apart from the typical communal issues here, the very fundamental thing is that this is against the principle of law. You see, the yes. the presumption of innocence is given up here. You see, if you belong to the wrong party, then there is a presumption of guilt. So between castes, okay. this uh, atrocities act uh, implies a presumption of guilt on the part of the higher uh, castes. Um, yes. The uh, Supreme Court has correctly judged that this is unconstitutional. And uh, Narendra Modi has made sure that a new law overruled the judgment of the Supreme Court. Um, so you see this, um, uh, this new form of caste discrimination is very much politically supported, is a very important fact in Indian social life at the moment. Um, then you have the whole thing of reservation, it's almost very complicated. I am rather happy for myself that I have not been born in a caste society, not in the caste society as it was traditionally, nor in the caste cauldron as it exists today. Um, but I mean, I'm sure that this will be solved because uh, just like in America, you have an enormous race polarization, but that's yes. only in the universities and such places. Ordinary people, you know, they can be friends with people of other races, of other religions and so on. In, in real social life, the polarization is by far not as bad as you could think, you know, reading the political uh, op-ed uh, pieces. Uh, and so similarly in India with caste, you see, I'm, I'm confident that 100 years from now, these things will lie behind us. But so yes. at the moment, I agree, you see this, you know, there is a very, very difficult situation. And so sometimes when... You know, in theoretical scholarly discussions, I hear these traditional uh, Brahmins defending, you know, the, the caste lines of the Manu Smriti or so. You know, I, I shudder to think, you know, how is this possible that someone can be so, so backward, so retrograde? But then on the other hand, when I see the, the other extreme, you know, the, the Ambedkarite movement and so on, yeah, it's also... Uh, it's also worrying that all this is happening, but you know we shouldn't exaggerate. Also, you see, part part of the reason to hope is simply the mentality of the Indian people. You know, you hear all these casteist anti-Brahmin slogans, especially in in Maharashtra and in Tamil Nadu. Um, you see, like this DMK at the moment with Stalin and his son uh, still swearing by. Uh, Ramaswamy Naikar, who said very openly, you know, we have to kill the Brahmins. And so, uh, okay, he said that. In fact, he said that like at the same time that the Nazis were saying we have to kill the Jews. But you yes. see, there is a difference. You see, the Germans are very thorough. So if they have a good idea, they will do something very good. And if they have a bad idea, well, unfortunately, they mean it. And so in India, there's a lot of talking and talking and talking. <laughs> and so, you see, yeah. sometimes it's a pity that it remains talk, but sometimes it's also a very good thing. So, so my question, next question was actually about the anti-Brahminism. Uh, we had an example when Mahatma Gandhi was murdered and uh, immediately after that, yes. there was an anti-Brahminism program in, in Maharashtra and Tamil Nadu example, as you gave. So where exactly do you think the roots of anti-Brahminism were? Was it the time of uh, uh, the Ramaswamy? Was it, was it way before that, that this whole thing anti-Brahmin was created to, you know, uh, make sure mm -hmm. that, you know, there is again this anti-Hindu thing building up through anti-Brahminism? Yes, yes I, I just said that in the case of Ramaswamy Naikar, you know, his genocidal words never led to a genocide. But, you know, there you give an example of where it did lead to a massacre. And so the jury is still out whether it was 15 people or 8,000 people who were killed. Uh, back then, I think the police reports are not that reliable because there was a lot of political pressure in keeping the lid on what was effectively happening. But so in that case, there was a massacre of Brahmins. And so part of the reason 
is you see the the Congress, the the loyalists of Mahatma Gandhi, who are taking revenge. But part of the reason is an old caste hatred that is, you know, 100, 200 years older, which dates back, especially to the time when the Peshwas effectively took over power from Shivaji. So Shivaji was not a Brahmin, the Peshwas were. And so that created a friction between them. Uh, also, other castes were, uh, you know, anti the Peshwa Brahmins, the, uh, the, the uh, Konkanast or the um, Chitpawan Brahmins, the ones, you know, from whom these Peshwas came. Uh, from whom also many freedom fighters came, Slavarkar, for example. Yes. Um, and then, indeed, you see the, the murder of Mahatma Gandhi, not to Ram um, So uh, there is a, a, a whole tradition. This ought to be historically verified, because I know that in these things, the, the role of propaganda is enormous. But so apparently, the Mahar caste, to which Ambedkar belonged, you know, was one of the early military, let's say, collaborators with the British, you know, who took service in the British Indian Army, and they fought against the Peshwas, you see, and they won decisive victories against the Peshwas. So that, too, is a historical source of hatred that, to quite an extent, gets transmitted from generation to generation. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of anti Chitpawan hatred uh, around, which usually did not translate into violence. But then when a trigger, you know, came like this, this very prominent murder, that was enough. And then you see even, even Indians were capable of these massacres. Yes. So as you mentioned, the story is being passed on from generation to generation. I think one of the things which uh, many Hindus, you know, think about, this is my interaction with many, uh, you know, people of my age, others, young people, many times they believe that many of our scriptures, uh, especially Ramayana and Mahabharat, in some way or other do promote uh, casteism. So there are instances in Mahabharat because uh, Karn was a Sudputra and Eklavya was not, you know, he was not trained by Dronacharya. These are examples of discrimination and again, Ram, Lord Ram, asking Sita to prove her chastity, which was in a way, uh, you know, masculinity and all that. Uh, there are instances, it is said, when once Lord Ram talked about someone who was from a lower caste and Adi Shankaracharya, you know, uh, and that Chandal incident. And so it is believed yeah. commonly that you know, there are instances in our scriptures which directly or indirectly promote this hierarchical system, promote this uh, discrimination and which we still see today. So what's, yes. what's your take? Well... You know, a, a, an apologetic um, explanation I often hear from the Hindu side is that caste is a recent phenomenon, which essentially was brought in by the British, although that in fact is already contradicted by another thing that they say, namely that the word caste is Portuguese, and that the Portuguese, uh, you know, two centuries earlier, projected onto Indian society something that they had seen in their own society. Okay, like. so let's explain. Um, you see, what the Portuguese were talking about was uh, endogamy phenomena. Uh, that is to say, the fact that people of one community only marry one another and don't marry outside of the community. They, they were familiar with that in Portugal. You see, first of all, at the time, you, you know, there was still a memory of a Jewish and a Muslim population in Portugal. Um, and they didn't intermarry, you know, among the Christians, Muslims, Jews were separate in terms of uh, marriage transactions. Then within the Christian community, there was also a distinction between the nobility and the commoners. They also didn't yes. intermarry. And so that is what they called casta, which is endogamy, the division of society in endogamous communities. Now, when they came to India, that's exactly what they saw. And so it is entirely justified of them to apply this Portuguese word to an Indian situation because it is really the same situation. So caste essentially means endogamy. Now, here in Indian terms, it does not so much mean the division in Varnas. Varna simply means that there are layers in 
a complex society. And these layers exist in every complex society, whatever the name you give them. Whereas Jati is a division in endogamous groups. This does not exist everywhere. You see, right now in the West, you very much have a class society, you have rich and poor. Nevertheless, in principle, uh, a rich man can marry a poor woman or vice versa. You know, there is, there may in certain social circles be a taboo on that, but there is no prohibition on that, not at all. And so in modern India, in urban India, this is also vanishing. But so in traditional India, this very much existed. One group, you know, is separate from another group. A member of the one cannot marry a member of the other. So, you know, endogamy or the division in jatis, that is very much an Indian practice long predating the British. However, however, um, you know, it's native to India, but it has not always existed and it is not intrinsic to Christianity. You see people like the Christian missionaries or Dr. Ambedkar in, in his book, uh, Annihilation of Caste, uh, claim that uh, caste is the soul of Hinduism. At most, you see, at that time, you could still say caste is the body of Hinduism. You know, is the effective manifestation of Hinduism in the human world. It's certainly not the soul of Hinduism. I mean, you have Hindu philosophy where caste is not mentioned. Sankhya philosophy does not talk about caste. Um, yes. But okay, you see, they said that caste is intrinsic to Hinduism. So the second yes. discussion in what way and so on, but they said caste is in intrinsic to Hinduism. So if you want to get rid of caste, you have to leave Hinduism. Hinduism. And so, you know, it's also in that sense that this, um, this Udhaya, what's his name, Stalin, recently said, you know, we want to annihilate uh, Sanatana Dharma. Sanatana. You see, largely, this is the idea that caste is intrinsic to Hinduism, which is aided which is helped by the historical circumstance that Sanatana Dharma has indeed for a century or so been used in the sense of casteist Hinduism. Why? Because it was used in opposition to the Arya Samaj. And so they spoke of Arya Dharma, everything they did they called Arya. And um, so Arya meant effectively Vedic. The Arya Samaj means the Vedicist society. And they correctly pointed out that in the Vedas there's no caste. You know, Rishi say, my father was a craftsman, not a Rishi. And um, so at that time, there no, no caste. You know, this, that's very much Hindu. The Vedas are very much Hindu, I thought. And yet no caste. Um, however, when that was applied in the modern age, when they said, okay, take an example of the Vedas, drop caste, then of course there was a reaction by many in Hindu society who stuck to the caste practice. And so they used the term for all of Hinduism, Sanatana Dharma, but now with a connotation of opposition to Arya Dharma and therefore, you know, casteist opposition to anti-caste reformism. So, you know, that, that mitigates a bit um, uh, Stalin's uh, rather crass uh, statement. But so at any rate, a number of people say that caste is intrinsic to Hinduism. It isn't. It was not there in the Vedas, even in the often cited Urusha Sukta. Urusha Sukta is, at a, is written at the fag end of the, Veda, of the Rig Veda the 10th book and, and very much at the end. And even their caste isn't present, contrary to what most Hindus think. And contrary to what many pro-caste people have been saying for 2000 years. You see, they used to refer to the Purusha Sukta to say, see, our highest authority, the Vedas, they support caste. Now, in fact, they don't, they support Varna. You see, they accept that there are four layers in society, as there are in any society. And um, they do not speak of 
uh, the two defining traits of caste. There is no heredity of profession. Your father can be a craftsman while you, while you are a rich. And there is no endogamy. It isn't said at all how these castes are recruited. These castes, sorry, these varnas, these classes, these layers, how they are recruited. So it doesn't say at all to be a Kshatriya, you have to be the son of a Kshatriya. Or yes. even you have to be the son of a Kshatriya and a woman who is the daughter of a Kshatriya. So, you know, this, this, is, this issue of recruitment is not mentioned at all. And so caste isn't present yeah. there. Then you see post-Veda, the editor of the Vedas, Veda Vyasa, you know, Krishna Dvaipayana, of his real name, he, um, he was the son of a sage, Parashara, who was a descendant of uh, Vasishtha, and uh, a fisherwoman. Or, you know, they met when she took the boat of her father to ferry customers across the Yamuna River. And so one customer she had one day was this Parashara, and halfway on the river, they liked each other. They stopped at an island in the river. They did whatever was needed so that the little boy uh, Krishna Dvaipayana resulted. And so he later became Veda Vyasa. Okay? Yes. So they were not of the same caste. And this was yes. no issue. Nobody ever said anything about it. Anything. And so... Then gradually you get paternal caste, you caste in the paternal line. So you have to do the uh, same profession as your father, which was in th that society fairly natural because people worked at home and you would learn the trade playfully, you know, while you were with your father. And so by the time you were old enough to rebel against anything your father dreamed about your future, you were already proficient in that profession. Yes. It was too late to change it for another. And so, you know, this, this was a relatively organic, natural development, uh, yeah. but it was not endogamous yet. And yeah. so you see the change at the time of the Buddha, at least among the aristocracy. The common people will follow only centuries later. But so around 500 BC, you get a situation that a friend of the Buddha, King Prasenajit, has a son uh, who, you know, during adolescence discovers that his mother is not a Kshatriya, that his father has been fooled by his in-laws, you know, who have passed on some illegitimate daughter um, as a princess. And so his father has married some, some lowly woman, although she looked like a princess, and therefore, the son thinks, I am not a Kshatriya, because my mother was not a Kshatriya. Then the Buddha is consulted, because the Buddha all his life was an advisor to kings and magnates and so on, yeah. sometimes on spiritual matters, but mostly on political and social matters. And so he said, but you see, there is no problem. Your father is a Kshatriya, so you are a Kshatriya. You know? And... Um, then the son says, yeah, but, you know, it's not like that anymore. You know, my father and my mother have to be of the same caste. So at that time, at that time, you see, there's an evolution going on and caste is getting hardened, getting more demanding. And so the demand of endogamy starts. And so first it is among the aristocracy, then the common people follow suit. And here we have a new development. Here we don't just have to consult scripture. No, you see, we have genetics. And so genetic studies of people allow us to know a lot of things about our ancestry. In, the ca in this case, in India, the division in jatis, in, in box-type separate communities who don't interact biologically, can be identified, you know, with a, a specific date, namely around 200 AD, 1800 years ago. The caste system is not older than that. But of course, while it was there, it was constantly uh, being supported. And so more and more scriptural 
arguments in its favor were found, or sometimes old scriptures were also manipulated, and so the later caste distinction was back projected onto ancient stories. A typical example, uh, Draupadi uh, gives this Swayamvara, where ultimately Arjuna wins her, but so Karna wants to participate. Karna is in fact the brother yes. of Arjuna, but she doesn't know that. And so she thinks he's of low caste and yes. she doesn't allow him to participate. Now you see this detail may very well have been entered into the story a thousand years later because the, the, the editing of the Mahabharat lasts for more than a thousand years. And yes. uh, so, so here you see, we, you know, we have to use literary and historical techniques to more or less sift from what is genuine, what is later interpolation. Okay. But so in general, in the period of the editing of the Mahabharata, we see the caste system growing and becoming more intense. A very uh, striking example of such an interpolation is the Shambhuka episode. So in the Ramayana, the seventh book is largely interpolated, the Uttarakhanda. And so yes. there we have an episode where Rama, who has been freely fraternizing with what today we would call scheduled caste people, you know, the Vanaras, the Bushmen, literally, if I may that, you know, mention that translation. You know, he's been there with them all the time. There's no issue of caste anywhere at all. And then suddenly he hears about the Shambuka. He doesn't even know the, the, the true facts. He doesn't find out. He just goes and uh, suddenly, without questions asked, kills this Shudra Shambuka. And moreover, he gets immediately rewarded from heaven. You know, flower petals are you know, rained on him. And uh, so this, you know, clearly is an episode later interpolated to justify later conceptions of caste. Yes. The entire Uttarakhand in this case was added later to uh, Ramayana as we see the critical edition mm -hmm. of Ramayana. The entire yes. kind was added later. But you see, this is a very clear cut case. There are subtler cases like the Bhagavad Gita. Today, right. Hindu apologists say the Bhagavad Gita is against caste by birth because it says explicitly, you know, caste is determined by guna and karma. Guna meaning quality and karma not meaning your past lives and so on, although that meaning has also grown, you know, been read into it. But karma in its primitive meaning of work. And so, yes. you see, it is obvious that this can be linked to birth. Because, you see, if your father has certain properties, if he's tall, then you probably are also tall. And, yes. um, or, you know, if your mother is black, then you will also be black or blackish, you know? Yeah. Uh, Chances are very high. Yes, if your father is, let's say, a card maker, then you learn the skills of card maker, and very probably that's what you will also do. And so there you could say, well, actually, what he says is that effectively caste is by birth. Whereas nowadays they say, no, no, it shows that caste is not by birth. But so in the intervening 10 or 20 centuries, people have been swearing by the Bhagavad Gita, no, this imposes caste by birth. Um, so, I mean, you know, th this, is, this is stuff for more study, more in depth and so on, more research. But generally, we can say, yes, there is an intervening period where Hinduism gets quite closely identified with caste practice. So now we are outgrowing that. And so my, um, my own opinion about it, and maybe this goes against the opinion of some of my friends who are attached to caste, you see, I've come to India totally untainted with the caste idea and you know I still find it strange and um, sometimes I don't know what to think about these friends because to my face 
they don't do anything caste this you know right. but maybe you know in other circumstances they do i'm not very sure um but i do see i do notice around me that caste I mean, in, in the only 35 years that I've been coming to India, I think I've noticed that caste really is declining. Uh, but I mean, that's only my impression. Maybe I'm wrong about that. Let's hope it uh, does the same. It keeps on declining, especially the discrimination, which we agreed, even to a lesser extent, but still exists. And I have to say this is probably the most effective explanation most logical explanation I ever got about the caste issues. So, sir, one last question uh, that is about the Aryan invasion theory. You have again written mm. in detail, you have, you have a book called Still Not Race of an Aryan Invasion. So, if you could explain a bit about that, how did this came into being? And now it has been largely been you know validated that no such thing existed. But again, its origins and, and how it was came into well, being. Well, its origins were fairly innocent. Um, namely, just a linguistic discovery. So first, a few travelers, sailors, had discovered that their own language was clearly related to the languages that they found in coastal India, Konkani, Marathi, Gujarati, and um, was related to English, to Italian, to Dutch. And then uh, a few Jesuits who were in India as missionaries um, use their leisure to study this more closely, especially um, a French Jesuit Jean Calmette, and then his uh, his pupil um, Gaston Laurent Coeur Doux, and he um, sent a paper to the Academy in Paris in 1767, in which he showed the close relation between Latin, Greek, and Sanskrit. Sanskrit. And uh, one of the first persons to learn of this was the French uh, Enlightenment intellectual uh, Voltaire. And he immediately went public with it, and he announced, you see, the origin of European culture is on the banks of the Ganga. This is exactly what he said. And so there is a lot that we have taken, you know, I've learned from India. Immediately, he did something that has happened more seriously later on with the Aryan, uh, no, with the Indo-European theory, namely the political use of, no, or the ideological use of it. So in his case, the use of it is that it greatly diminishes the importance of Christianity for European culture. Yes. Because he says, Originally, before Christianity, there was already a European culture taking shape, influenced by India. And um, so, you know, this becomes, unfortunately, a tradition that many people will try to draw this Indo-European kinship to themselves to argue this way or that. Anyway, but so this is purely linguistic. And so there is no special... Um, intention behind it, even though um, Gaston Laurent Curdoux was an ardent missionary. You see, you could say he was against Hinduism. He tried to draw people out of Hinduism. And he also expressed his great satisfaction when he was a witness of Christians demolishing a Hindu temple. So you could say he was a Christian fanatic. And yet, and yet, this paper was just a scholarly work. You know, you have to live with the complexities of human nature. Such combinations are possible. Then uh, the one who brought this, this new insight in India is William Jones. In 1786, he gave a speech in Kolkata. Um, and you have to note about this, you see, that he greatly praised Sanskrit. You know, I mean, many people in India say, yeah, the Aryan invasion theory is only, uh, you know, to, 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 to disparage Hinduism and so on. No, no. The first generation greatly admired Hinduism. And in fact, there was some kind of an Indo-manic wave in Europe at the time, you know, late 18th century, early 19th. Um, so, um, uh, for instance, Immanuel Kant, 
the probably biggest yes. European philosopher, uh, you know, spoke in the same sense as Voltaire. Several other great intellectuals, likewise, Johann Herder, Jules Michelet, and so on, um, Friedrich Schlegel. I mean, there were many. You see, this was a wave. And so at that time, it was generally assumed, because of the role that Sanskrit had played in this discovery, that the country of origin must be India. Also, because clearly, Sanskrit was older than Latin and Greek. Yeah. You know, um, I mean, for a number of technical reasons that I'll now, you know, forego explaining. Um, but so the next phase is also innocently linguistic, namely that several discoveries lead some people to think that, you know, this whole story is more easily explained if we assume a homeland around the Caucasus. And so, you know, it has moved a little bit here and there, but essentially it has stayed around that area. And so the most recent, um, the most recent theory from, you know, the 1920s till, till last year um, was that the homeland was in Ukraine, Russia, um, Southern European Russia. So uh, on the steps, as they said, and um, so this theory has now, in 2023, been challenged, not so much by Indians, I mean also by Indians, but the situation in this debate at the moment is that in the West they ignore everything that comes out of India. But yes. nevertheless, Westerners themselves have started questioning it. And so... Yeah. You have uh, a geneticist, David Reich, who has been very uh, famous in India in 2018, when an Indian intellectual, uh, Tony Joseph, a Christian uh, top journalist, um, used the findings of David Reich to argue in favor of the Aryan invasion theory. And because, you know, Reich posits an influx of people from the Northwest in about 18, 1700 BC. So he says, ah, this is the Aryan invasion. Whereas, of course, it's only an influx of people. You don't know what language they spoke. When the Turks came, when the Greeks came, when the Huns came, when the Kushanas came, they all brought their genes into India. These genes exist yes. till today in the Indian population. Yet Absolutely. none of them maintain this language. There is no Turkic lobby in India, there is no Greek lobby, there is no Tocharian lobby, and so on. They all assimilated. You know, why would those people in 1700 BC have acted differently? Um, and moreover, moreover, we know that those people didn't bring Sanskrit, because there are other reasons, you know, other findings, astronomical, archaeological, and so on, that we know for sure that the Rig Veda is earlier than that. You know, it yes. stretches back to 3000 BC or even beyond. And so the people who came in 1700 BC cannot have brought the Sanskrit language because the Sanskrit language was already in India. Even yes. if brought by immigrants 2000 years earlier, but, you know, the classical Aryan invasion theory clearly can't be correct. Now, you know, a few things have been happening in the West. So his um, our, uh, genetic uh, theory of the uh, homeland is that the people in, in Russia, Ukraine, ultimately came from northwestern Iran, Armenia, Iran. So from the south of the Caucasus. It's still around the Caucasus mountains. That tradition somehow continues, but it's not in Europe anymore. And it's a lot closer to India. And um, at the same time, from the linguistic angle, you see on totally different grounds, uh, Paul Haggerty has uh, written a paper which was co-signed by many of the top Indo-European uh, scholars in Europe. Um, that said that the uh, origin for linguistic reasons was in Armenia thereabouts. So practically the same area 
as that's been pointed by uh, David Reich. So there is something moving. And so somehow, by coincidence, nobody of those people had planned it that way. It's already halfway to India, and it's not in Europe anymore. And so there's a big change, and it's far more fun to you know argue the whole case with the people who come with this new theory than with the old Aryan invasion theory, which was just very hostile to India. Right. So it, it's it's great that you know thanks to scholars like you who are awakening Hindus and Indians and you know they are understanding and uh, appreciating uh, their culture and we, we hope that you know you keep on uh, studying and writing more and more books and all those who will be watching this on YouTube uh, Dr. Elsa has written a lot many books and uh, all I would say is that if you have not read him trust me you are missing something and this is coming from someone who has read extensively on Hinduism and India. Dr. Ayers, thank you so much for uh, being on the podcast. It was an honor talking to you and wish you all the best for your future and wish you good health. Yeah, it was my pleasure. Namaste. Thank you. Namaste. Thank you.